Let's now proceed to the formation of the contract of sale. The first stage in the formation of the contract of sale is solicitation or negotiation. This stage covers the doctrine of freedom to contract, which signifies that a person has the right to choose with whom to contract. This stage is formally initiated by an offer, which must be certain. Let's say John offers to sell his house to Mark for $2.5 million, and then Mark negotiated for a lower price of $2 million. The lower price constitutes a counteroffer and is therefore not an acceptance of the offer of John. At any time prior to the perfection of the contract, either party may stop the negotiation. At this stage, the offer may be withdrawn. The withdrawal is effective immediately after its manifestation. John can also enter into an option contract with Mark. An option contract is a preparatory contract in which one party grants to the other, for a fixed period and under specified conditions, the power to decide whether or not to enter into a principal contract. It binds the party who has given the option not to enter into the principal contract with any other person during the period designated. And, within that period, to enter into such contract with the one to whom the option was granted if he should decide to use the option. It is a separate agreement distinct from the contract of sale. Thus, it must be supported by a consideration separate from the price of the sale. Otherwise, the option is void, but the offer remains valid for the given period. For an option to rise to the level of a contract of sale, there must be a formal absolute acceptance of the option offer. This is what we call the double acceptance rule. Here, under the option contract, Mark may validly and effectively exercise his right by merely advising John of his decision to buy and expressing his readiness to pay the stipulated price as soon as John is able to execute the proper deed of sale. Note that an option not exercised within the period is extinguished. Let's say John is the owner lesser and Mark is the lessee of John's property. A right of first refusal means that should John decide to sell the property during the term of the lease, such sale should first be offered to Mark. And the series of negotiations that transpire between them on the basis of such preference is already a compliance even when no final purchase agreement is perfected between them. Thereafter, John is at liberty to offer the sale to a third party. Now let's say Mark has a standing right of first refusal as the lessee, and he subleased the property to Peter. Here, the right of first refusal cannot be exercised by the sublessee. Note also that the right of first refusal cannot be the subject of specific performance, but breach on the part of the promiser would allow recovery of damages. After solicitation or negotiation is the perfection stage, which is the meeting of the minds upon the object and upon the price of the contract. Being a state of mind, mutual consent may only be inferred from the confluence of two acts of the parties. First, an offer certain as to the object of the contract and its consideration, and second, an acceptance of the offer which is absolute, meaning it refers to the exact object and consideration embodied in the said offer. In an instance where the supposed buyer merely placed the word noted and signed below such word at the bottom of the written offer, it is not considered an absolute acceptance. And in an instance where the offer is subject to the approval by the higher authorities, the offer is not considered certain.
In a sale by auction, the owner's terms and conditions for the sale of property under auction are binding on all bidders whether or not they knew of them. An auction sale is perfected by the fall of the hammer or in other customary manner. Earnest money given by the buyer shall be considered as part of the price and as proof of the perfection of the contract. It constitutes an advance payment to be deducted from the total price. When there is no provision for a forfeiture of earnest money and the sale fails to materialize, then with the rescission, it becomes incumbent upon the seller to return the earnest money as legal consequence of mutual restitution. Where parties merely exchanged offers and counter-offers, there being no perfection of a contract of sale yet, money given as deposit cannot be considered as earnest money, since such term applies only to a perfected sale. Because of its consensual character, form is not important for the validity of sale. The law does not require that the sale of land be in a public instrument or notarized deed in order to validate the contract, but only to ensure its efficacy. So the sale of land under private instrument is still enforceable between the parties. A notarized deed of sale does not guarantee the validity of sale. It merely enjoys the presumption of regularity and due execution. To overthrow this presumption, Sufficient, clear, and convincing evidence is required, otherwise, the document should be upheld. Notarization by one who was not a notary public does not affect the validity of the contract of sale. The deed merely remained a private document. The legal consequence of the sale not being a public instrument would only be that both its due execution and its authenticity must be proven pursuant to the rules of court. There are instances, however, where form is important for enforceability, such as those under the Statute of Frauds. Statute of Frauds refers to law provisions which requires certain enumerated contracts, such as agreements for the sale of real property, to be in writing and signed by the parties, the purpose being to prevent fraud and perjury in the enforcement of obligations. Its application presupposes a valid contract of sale. Statute of Frauds does not apply to contracts either partially or totally performed. Also, a contract that violates the statute of frauds is ratified by the acceptance of benefits under the contract. So in our previous example, without a deed of sale, if John accepted the purchase price from Mark as payment for his house, statute of frauds no longer apply, meaning the contract is already enforceable between the parties. Note, however, that while the sale of land appearing in a private deed is binding between the parties, it is not binding on third persons if it is not embodied in a public instrument and recorded in the Registry of Deeds. So that's it for the formation of the contract of sale. Thank you for listening.